Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Museum of the QAnon's online presentation, Copper Country Streetcars by Bill Spruill. My name is Lise Nelson. I'm the director of the museum and I will be your moderator this evening. Word about the museum and its program. All of our exhibits and presentations, including this event, are made possible through financial donations of members and supporters and a lot of volunteers. You can find out more about the museum and our ongoing programs by going to our website, carnegiekiwana.org. I'd like now to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. William Spruill, who joined Michigan Tech in 1996 and taught in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering until his recent retirement. Over the years, Bill taught a variety of courses in traffic engineering, transportation planning, airport planning, highway design, public transit, and hockey history. The author of several books about copy co copper country history, Bill's professional interests are evident in his local history publications. His most recent publication in 2019 was Houghton, the birthplace of professional hockey. And in 2013, he published Images of Rail, Copper Country Street, Streetcars, the subject of our talk this evening. Both books are available locally at Northwind Books in Hancock, and both are chock full of historical photos. Bill, welcome, and I look forward to hearing your presentation and discussing streetcars. Thanks very much, Elise. Uh, it's uh, kind of been a, this is kind of an interesting project that started, well, maybe over 10 years ago that I had a project with the Kiwa National Historic Park, and then uh, it evolved into a book project. Um, one of the things that made it a book project was uh, Many in the area probably know this gentleman, uh, Jim Mullane. He was uh, a teacher at Chassel, and uh, he passed away in 2011. And uh, in 2012, his neighbors were helping Jim's sister uh, clean out his, uh, his home in Chassel. And uh, Kurt Smith and Bob Gilray um, came to me and said, I, you've done something on streetcars. Would you be interested in Jim's collection on streetcars? And so 25 boxes arrived in my office at Tech at the time. There were a couple boxes on the uh, on the Copper Country streetcars, but Jim was an avid collector. He traveled the world gathering up streetcar and railroad material. So I spread around the uh, the materials that I didn't need to just for transit and, and uh, streetcar museums in North America. So his, his collection is being used by many now. But I ended up with a couple of boxes and uh, with the stuff that I had done with the research project, kind of turned it into this book project. Um, so as Elise said, it, uh, the book came out a few years ago. She mentioned it is available in North Winds. It's available in Copper, Wind, Copper World up in Calumet. It's uh, uh, bookworm, it's, uh, and you can uh, get it online through Acadia Publishing. So it's been a fun project. Uh, over the years, so we've made this presentation shortly after it came out, and Elise organized a couple of uh, streetcar tours where we, we traced the route uh, on, a, on a bus uh, that stopped at many of the places we'll, we'll see today. So I, I've just kind of packaged this into a few few points for us. Uh, we'll take a look a little at the history of the Copper Country. I think this audience probably knows everything there is to know about the Copper Country, but we'll just highlight a couple things. We'll take a look at the, the Houghton County Street Railroad Company, the Houghton County Traction Company, a few items. And when I first started this, making the presentation shortly after the book came out, uh, in the question period, people would say, did you know? And at that time, I didn't know. So there almost just should be an update of what I've learned since the book came out. So we'll see uh, what I don't know yet from this audience tonight. So the Copper Country, uh, I say, this audience is probably very familiar with where the Copper Country is. It, um, just as you know, the Cayman Peninsula in 1841, Douglas Houghton uh, reported to the state of Michigan on the prospects for copper mining in this uh, in the Keweenaw Peninsula. He reported back that uh, that there was copper to be had. And in the 1840s, several companies set up, um, uh, started mining copper throughout the uh, throughout the peninsula. And towns were built next to, to the mines. 
Uh, Intercity Railroad Service linked this area to Chicago, uh, to M Minneapolis, to Duluth, and to Sault Ste. Marie. There were basically two main rail lines that provided that service, the Copper Range and the Mineral Range, which ended up be part of the Blue South Shore and Atlantic. And there were a number of transfers that, that uh, people could make to get to this area, to and from this area, to link to the rest of the world. So we're really back in, um, so really uh, kind of a look at what the Copper Country was in 1900. Let's say it was the most prosperous uh, area in the world because of the time of demand for the copper industry and er, for electrical, indus electrical industry and copper was the main, main components. So in the early 1900s, many new homes and businesses were built. I put down here to give you a sense for what the census was in 1900. Houghton County had about 65,000 people. Uh, Houghton had about 4,000. Hancock was a little larger. Lake Linden. And then Calumet, uh, kind of a, uh, you call it a metropolitan area that included Red Jacket, Lorium, and other communities in what we know as the Calumet area today. And the population was about 35,000. Today, today, or in 1910, it grew to about 100, almost 100,000. So the, from 1900 to 1910 was really a growth area in this particular area. Now, as mentioned, Calumet, um, the, the main, the main uh, uh, find of copper was the Calumet Lode. It was discovered in 1864. And there were two companies at the time, a Calumet Mining Company and the Hecla. They eventually merged. And uh, it was the largest uh, copper mining company really in the world. Now, the president of the time for much of this from from the from the shortly after the discovery uh, till 1910 was this Alexander Agassi. He was the president of the firm. There's almost a whole presentation of, that could be made about him and his uh, his career. A fascinating person. We'll touch on him later with some of the decisions that were made for the uh, for the um, mining company. But this is kind of on the left left hand side. Is really kind of a, a, a a photograph of what the mining operations for Calumet and Heckler look like, really in the south end of what, what we know as Calumet today. Now, streetcars were pretty common uh, throughout North America and, and the world in the early 1900s. This is, uh, I think, a photo out of the Detroit area. But there were streetcars in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, there were, you can see in the slide, Escanaba. Iron River, Ironwood, Marquette, Sault Ste. Marie, and the Copper Country. The photo on the left side is really a, a, the streetcars in Marquette. And each one had a, a line or a network of streetcar routes. This is how people got around the, these communities at that time. Well, we're going to focus on, uh, on the Copper Country. Well, and, and the company with it set up, uh, James R.D. Was the, was the president of the Peninsula Electric Light and Power Company. And they set up almost like a, uh, a subsidiary of that, the Houghton County Street Railroad Company. Now, Stone and Webster was a major uh, consulting firm at the time and, and contractor. And, and they financed many of these uh, streetcar operations in North America at the time. They would come in, they would do the financial back the project, they would do all the engineering and design work and supervise the construction. The first uh, uh, line that was built uh, began uh, and construction began, and you can see here on June 1900, a line between Houghton and Boston, Michigan. Now, a powerhouse and car barn were built in West Hancock. The powerhouse was on the portage. We'll see a photo of it later. And the car barn, actually the car barn is still there. It's on Ethel Street in West Hancock. Service began the end of October 1900. And then the network was expanded, the system was expanded in, in the in following years. In 1901, it was extended from downtown Houghton to East Houghton. We'll see photos of many of these uh, places later. 
And it was also extended north to serve Lorium, Red Jacket, and Wolverine. In 1903, they built a, a branch line from, uh, from uh, basically the uh, Lorium, Red Jacket area to Lake Linden and Hubble. And then the final extension in 1908 was an extension from Wolverine to Mohawk. Now, the, the, they were electrically powered vehicles they, that um, the size of an urban bus, basically, provided a frequent and dependable service in towns and between towns in the Copper Country, and we'll see that on maps and some of the details we get into. Now, it, uh, it probably has a number of names. Uh, when we think of streetcars, trolleys, or trams, that's often in between towns, but interurban is a, a term that is used to, to, link, to link towns together. So in southern Michigan or Indiana, there was a number of interurbans that linked the communities together. They're smaller vehicles, electrically powered that would operate um, between the small between the towns. Uh, when I say frequent service, we'll see the schedules. We, we looked at the inner city rail lines. There may be uh, eight to 10 trains a day. Well, this could operate every half hour or less than that throughout the, throughout the day. Uh, passengers would, would board and light uh, the, on the street in towns, just like a bus, a fixed bus stop or at stations between towns, and we'll see some of that as, as the presentation goes on. Now, the name was changed. It became the Houghton County Transit Company in 1908, and I think there were some financial changes and advantages to making that change. So I said they were, were basically operated on street loading. This is one of the cars, and at busy times, they could load from both ends of the car. The, um, they were two-way operations. So you can see the, the, the trolley pole. Well, that's where they got their power from the overhead wire. So the, the vehicle would come to the end of the line. The, the operator, could, the motorman could get out. He'd go to the other end. They'd flip the trolley pole. And uh, so it's almost like a stub end. So there's no loops or turnarounds at the end. And so it's kind of a stub at the end and they just flip the pole. Um, and so, so well, well, we'll look at it a, couple, a few slides later. This is the map in 1909 of the, the trolley company. So we'll see some photos of some of the places along the way, but it went from basically the Michigan College of Mines through downtown Houghton, across the, the upper level of the Portage Lake Bridge, through downtown Hancock, up to Ethel Street, where the car barn is, and then it would head up the hill past the Quincy Mind, um, and and uh, you can see where uh, Boston, the Boston area here, and then it would head up, and it would would head through through Lorium, and then come in through the back door in Calumet, and basically all the way up to Mohawk, and then the the line to Lake Linden. Now, this is what the system looked like in 1909. Uh, as the years went by, they added a few additional stations. So if you look at recent maps, you'll find a few extra stations on here that aren't shown on the 1909 map. And there may be some questions about that later. So the total system was 20, 27 miles. It was on street running in town. And they basically had a single track with bypass sections on separate right of way between towns. So they weren't sharing the tracks with any other vehicles. Standard railroad gauge, and they ran on a ran every day on a public schedule. There, there are basically five routes. You see, you could go from Houghton to Red Jacket, which Red Jacket is what we know as Calumet today. Downtown, the business area of, of Calumet today was really Red Jacket. So you could get on the on the streetcar in Houghton and go up to Red Jacket. You could travel from Red Jacket to Lorium through this this Elbin station. 
I think we'll show you that photo of the next one. Then you could go from Lorium to Lakeland and Hubble. You could go from Albion to Wolverine and Albion to Mohawk. So if I wanted to travel from Houghton to Mohawk, I would have to, I would pass through and actually change trains or change cars in at the Albion station. That was kind of one of the major transfer point, points. And here's the Albion station. It is there today uh, in, uh, in El the Albion area of the Calumet. Uh, today you see the back end of the, you see the other, other end of the, if you drive by the Bottle Works, I think is the name of the company, or the store, uh, you see it from the other end. But this is kind of one of the, the major transfer points. The bottom levels quite often had a waiting area and often would have a store. And the manager of the store would live in the upper, upper floor of this particular facility. Now, you're probably not going to be able to read this, but I'll point out a couple of things. This is a timetable from 1913. There were streetcars from uh, East Houghton, that, this would be the Michigan College of Mines, for Hancock and Calumet. And when you say Calumet, that's basically kind of red jacket in that area. And they would operate from 6.30 in the morning to 11, 11 at night, 11.30 at night, every half hour. Then, then the uh, coming the other way, you can see, again, every half hour. If you're going from Calumet to Lake Linden, it was every hour. But if you looked at here from, from the Douglas House in Houghton to Hancock, it was every 15 minutes. So you actually may see several cars on the line at any one time. Uh, there was Sunday service. There was Saturday service. Um, this table's it in the book if you really want to study it and uh, you can dig into a few more of the timetables. But basically, in many cases, from uh, Calumet to Mohawk was hourly, really from early in the morning till later in the evening. The fares on the system were, it was based on a zone system. So if you were traveling between Houghton and Hancock, it was five cents. If you were traveling all the way to Red Jacket, it was 30 cents. So you actually went through several different zones. Um, now, it did, in the later years, it was increased to eight cents, uh, eight cents a zone. Well, is that, ex is that expensive? In today's times, it's probably not too bad. Just to give you some idea, a miner at that time was probably making about 25 cents an hour. Um, they had a 60-hour week. Although miners usually, they did not travel extensively on, on a system other than for special events, but it was not a commuter-type system. The children would ride free. There were weekly passes. There were special event fairs. There were a number of different things. But just give you a sense of how much it would be to travel on the system. There were, there were basically two types of cars that were used what they called dinkies, these were the smaller ones. They would have seating for about 30 passengers. They would be the ones be used for the shorter trips between Houghton and Hancock or between uh, Red Jacket and, and Lorium. Um, but, and there were four of those. The largest number of vehicles were these interurbans. So they, they, could, they would travel the longer distances. They were four axles seating for 40 or 50 passengers. And there, as I said, there were about 20, 21 of those. So the, the system had about 25 cars, and they were each numbered. So you can... Uh, uh, now, this is what the seating looked like in many of the dinkies. It was, uh, you'd face, uh, you'd be, um, I guess, parallel to the, to the main aisle. This is a group that was traveling uh, probably in the Houghton Hancock area or Red Jacket to, to Lorium. Um, and there would be the, the, this was kind of one of these pose shots, there would be a conductor and a motorman. So typically the operations you would load at the front, you may exit at the back, but there would be the, the, the motorman would, at the end of the line at the stub, 
they would they would just flip the trolley pole, put up the trolley pole, then he'd go to the other end and and re return. The the uh, the conductor he would collect the fares on the vehicle itself. This is what the seating in an interurban car would look like. Uh, you basically you would uh, you would ride facing forward. And so at the end of the line, as the motor man was uh, uh, changing the trolley pole and would relocate to the end or other end of the car, the conductor would go and flip all the seats. So the passengers would be, would be facing forward all the time. Now we'll, we'll, we've got a series of slides here that kind of give you some idea of what, what it might look like. Uh, this is downtown Houghton. You probably recognize the, the Douglas House. But here was a, a single track down the middle of Sheldon Avenue. Um, and it basically went on a single track from the bridge right through to the Michigan College of Mines. So they'd schedule it uh, um, so that, that they wouldn't have interfering traffic. Now we're going to just turn around and and really from the Douglas House area look to the other direction. We're looking east now. We're looking towards where the Michigan College of Mines is. We're still on Sheldon Avenue. You can see the tracks right down the middle of, and then it turns at the end where the bookworm is now. And there's a few years later. This is the turn at the end of that, at the end of Sheldon, right by the Franklin Square, and the bookworm is right here now. And this is the, the vehicle turning at that location. You can tell by the, the vintage of the cars, what, the audience can probably guess what year this was taken. Now this is a photo of the Michigan College of Mines in the, in the uh, uh, 1920s. Uh, College Avenue, right down, the, you know it today, all the university was, was basically north of College Avenue. The streetcar did not operate on College Avenue, but rather one block south. It operated on Houghton Avenue and then switched over at where we know of Jim's Food Mart today. It switched over and operated on Jasper, again, about a block parallel to the to College Avenue. And Jasper then runs, in, runs into Ruby, and then it really ends up around the bookworm now is where it would come out and head downtown. So a little different route. They, I guess the the designers or the planners didn't want it running along the uh, in front of the, the stately homes on College Avenue. This is just a look at it on um, westbound, uh, and I think it's on I, the book I first identified as uh, it was operating on Jasper. But uh, former President uh, Maras, he, I guess when he was a student here in the, in the 70s, he recognized, he said he lived in this house and it was on Ruby. So that's, you can, if you have a copy book, you can change the, uh, change it. This is on Jasper, right next to Jim's Food Mart. We're looking west. You probably recognize that house at the end now because it is still there. So it would travel this way, and then right at at Agate, it would jog a little bit, still continuing on Jasper and head head down this way. It was kind of interesting. This last summer, they they were renovating or rebuilding Jasper, and they just and they uh, uncovered all kinds of streetcars, so or uh, streetcar rails. So if you're standing there, you could have taken home a, a streetcar rail. This is the uh, uh, the cover, the, the photo that was used on the cover. We're, we're downtown Houghton, uh, right at Huron Street. So Huron Street is right across us in front of us. Uh, you can see the Douglas House uh, behind us. So we're heading west. Again, single track. Um, a couple of other things. There's uh, the D Hotel. This is James D. owned that hotel. And he had a bowling alley in it, too. And next to him, he built the Lowe Theater. So he was, he was quite an entrepreneur at the time. It's almost a, you can have a presentation on D on his, his activities. This is the photo that the lease used in uh, the advertising for this one. 
Uh, what? So we're really getting ready to cross the bridge. So we basically went from a single track and across the bridge, it was a double track. So this is where one of the few um, uh, streetcars could pass, one going one direction, the other one going the other direction. Uh, this is probably early 1900s. But what's also good about this particular photo gave you some idea of what the color of the vehicles were. They basically were green vehicles. Photo across the bridge. The streetcars came across the top level of the bridge. The railroads were used the bottom level. This is the, uh, the bridges from the early 1900s. And it was in place until till the, the new Portage Lake lift bridge in the, of over 50 years ago when it was built. So uh, automobile traffic and the streetcars would operate along the top. Probably recognize a couple of buildings like the courthouse. So we're basically from Hancock looking across to, to Houghton on this particular slide. Now we're, we're heading into Hancock. Uh, this is Preservation and Quincy. So US 41 makes the turn here. So basically what happened here was that they, they would be double levels on the bridge, climbs the hill a bit, and then makes that turn. And then it's two, two tracks through downtown Hancock. This building is still there. Um, if you look at so this would be the northwest corner, the northeast corner, tracks going around here, were the Scott Hotel and a very popular, the Curridge uh, Theater. That was a major attraction uh, in the area. And this is an early photo from the 1900s in downtown um, uh, Hancock where a westbound and eastbound streetcar on, on Quincy, but the one coming to you is heading to the west, one going the other way. So there's a double tracks through downtown Hancock. So at first scheduling, they would organize them uh, in such a way. This is the power plant. Uh, it has since been probably in the last 20 years. It's been uh, it's been uh, dismantled, and, but it was on the, the Portage Lake waterfront, and it basically that was a, a power generator for it. And so they bring in coal and. Uh, to run the generators to generate the electricity. This is the, the car barn on Ethel um, at Inga, right across from the Keweenaw Co-op. It is uh, superior sand and gravel today, um, and it has a little different look, but this is one of the major places where, and you can see a number of tracks uh, coming in for, uh, for and they would store their streetcars inside in the winter. There was a car barn uh, in Lorium, and there was a car barn, or uh, a small garage in Boston. Uh, so they would store the cars inside in the winter. Now, so they, they would go by the car barn and then make the turn at, uh, at uh, uh, adding it onto elevation. And this was a bit of a challenge if you're familiar with the area. There's quite a grade from, from where that intersection is to climb the hill. This uh, photo here is of the, uh, the Hancock Mine at Elevation and Ingot. So the grade was 7.5% going up. So you're basically starting from a stretch. They put out sand to help uh, climb the hills in the winter. Um, but going down was a bit of a challenge because you had to kind of slow the car down to make the turn. So at the at, uh, Ingot and uh, Ethel Street, there was actually uh, almost like you say a stub line that kept going towards Driving Park, just in case they didn't make the turn. We're further along on the on the trip now, with our with our interurban car heading north. The vehicles would travel 30 to 40 miles an hour uh, between towns. In town, they would operate probably 15 to mid 15 to 20 miles an hour in town. So a trip from Houghton to Red Jacket was about an hour and 15 minutes. As I said, along the way, 
between towns there are these small stations. This is, you can see where this one is, this is the Boston Station. It's on the southwest corner of Pontiac Road and the Boston Crosscut in downtown Boston. It, the building is still there today. It is a, a light blue building um, with light blue siding on it. Uh, it was the Boston Station. And so tough to read here, but the sign was almost like a confectionery store that you could buy some snacks. And the operator that was given, so, so to see, the franchise for this, he, he and his family would live upstairs over, over the... Uh, over the station. Um, one of the things I learned as I was uh, after the book came out is that this the gentleman uh, drove me up past the Boston Station, pointed out all this, and he said, "You know, there's a there's a baseball park. There was a baseball park on the northwest corner of this one. This is on the southwest corner. Well, across the street from there's a baseball park, and it was called." What do you call a baseball park in Boston? Fenway Park. So this is just another photo. You can see the the uh, the, the car coming in the distance. They say they were kind of they were um, were north of Boston, heading towards uh, heading towards the Calumet area. The there's the the power line. But they were exclusive right away, so they were fenced off. So they didn't want people walking easily crossing the tracks. Standard railroad gauge, a lot of stamp signs used, just uh, like a railroad would have. One of the interesting aspects uh, of the rail line here was that there, the Michigan Railroad Commission would not permit at grade crossings between a railroad and a streetcar line. So there were eight different trestles like this that were built over the railroad lines. So this, and with a clearance of 23 feet. So they would go over top of the railroads. There were, say, there were um, about eight of them between Hancock and Mohawk. And we can go back to a map and identify where they were, but they were uh, wooden trestles that were used. Now, as we head north to the Calumet area, as I said before, we, we actually, we're, the north is towards the top of this. So when we really came in, we threw Lorium. Here's the Albion Station. And then we would almost like come into downtown Red Jacket through the back door. We'll show you in a photo here in a little while what the route was. But basically, it came in really on Pine Street. Went down 6th, and this is Oak. This is Oak. Now, the Copper Range had a rail station next to the, the uh, Palestra in Lorium. They had one here. There was also a Copper Range station here, in this, over in this area. And the Mineral Range, this was their line right here, and they had a, their station right on Oak Street. So there were, th those were the intercity rail lines. So you could come in on the Mineral Range Railroad, transfer onto the streetcar on, and go to different spots. Um, now, this is kind of one of the questions that you often have. Well, why didn't they go through right into Red Jacket? So let's say this is kind of the Calumet area that include all these different. Well, uh, there are some that theorize that, that Agassiz did not want his workers congregating on these on, from the different mining companies meeting on the streetcar. Uh, but probably the main reason was, if you start thinking about the, a lot of the Calumet Heckle operations were in the south end. And now we've got that requirement that you can't have um, a, a streetcar line at grade with, with a rail line. You'd have to elevate the, the streetcar line through all these different areas. So really kind of an engineering challenge. So. So it was really to kind of bypass that area for uh, for almost like a cost reason. So this is what the, uh, the streetcar, northbound streetcar on Hecla Street in downtown Lorium. 
And this is a photograph probably taken in the 1920s in, in Red Jacket, now the village of Calumet. Um, Red Jacket became the village of Calumet in 1929. So to give you, we're looking south here. So across the bottom of the slide is, is Pine Street. This is the 6th six, Street. And Oak is down toward in this area here. A little further down is where Oak is. Here's the, uh, the Coliseum. It opened in 1914. So it was kind of the end of the streetcar line, which was really kind of nice. This is Agassiz Park. So you see all this development of Calumet and Heckler over the south end of Calumet. So that's kind of, I, I suspect that, that they are reluctant to build because of that Michigan Railroad Commission requirement on separation between at grade and um, streetcars. There's a very large network of rail lines in this particular area. So fifth is right here, the, where we really downtown. There's just kind of a photo of you. Probably everybody recognizes uh, uh, this building here, the Calumet Theater. Well, there was the the um, the the line right in front of it. Just a single line um, through downtown uh, Calumet or uh, Red Jacket. This is the uh, the Mineral Range Station on Oak Street. So this was kind of the the end of the line, this was the major railroad station. The uh, Mineral Range Railroad had connections to the um, to the Loose South Shore, and uh, and so the Loose South Shore ran across the Upper Peninsula with connections to several railroads. But this is what probably the main rail station for Red Jacket. So many people would would come in to on the on the intercity rail transfer on the streetcar for distribution in the area. There were a number of special events that took place and the streetcar was part of it. This is at the, at uh, probably many recognize this, this is at Oak Street and 6th. This is the Michigan House right here. Well, the streetcar was part of it. This is where they make the turn. Whoops. They make the turn towards the, to the Mineral Range Rail Station. This is one of the, the um, parades or rallies during the 1913 strike. This is a streetcar amongst, I'm not sure all these people are waiting for the streetcar, but basically it's the Calumet Theater and they were just following a, a 1913 rally at the, uh, at the Calumet Theater. The uh, the, the streetcars provided many opportunities for these communities in the in the Keweenaw to to interact, and baseball was one of them. So it was easy for baseball teams to transfer travel from from among the different communities to the community baseball teams. And it also was very easy for the for the spectators to follow their team uh, with this frequent service. And they'd actually many times they put on extra service. Uh, to cater to these to these fans. Naturally, one of the most popular winter sports here was hockey. Uh, this is uh, a car in the Lorium area heading in the front panel here is advertising hockey. Um, but if you kind of look at one of the ads of the time, they would add there'd be special trains. It adds the Copper Range or the Middle Range would 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 provide extra trains from the Calumet area to Houghton. This is the Amphidrome in downtown Houghton. They'd provide extra streetcar service. So they would line up cars to, to, uh, take, to take the spectators back home after the game. Probably everybody has seen this photo of the Amphidrome. Basically, it's, a, it's where D Stadium is today, but we're basically a block from Sher, Shel, uh, Shel, Sheldon Avenue. The, the, the Mineral Range Railroad ran right by it, and the station is right by the library today. That was the main station. So people would, the Mineral Range would, would travel into this area from uh, Barraga or Marquette quite easily for a hockey event. And uh, the mineral range, they take them down from Calumet or from Red Jacket in here very easily to see event. But, but
but the, the service wasn't as frequent as the streetcars could provide. Probably one of the unique uh, uh, places on the whole network was Electric Park. Now, Electric Park, if you search around, you'll see electric parks all over the United States. The Electric Park was built by the, by the Houghton County Traction Company. It was designed, the only way you could get there was by streetcar. And it was, uh, you can see by the ads here, there was uh, dancing, there were uh, concerts, and see there's the most popular resort in the Copper Country during the summer months. It was open just during the summer. They bring in all kinds of amusement rides for children. It was the place to go on Saturday night or on the weekends. This is the, uh, the Electric Park main building, it, and you can see the streetcar track went right by it. Um, it's, uh, when spring comes, you, as you travel up to Calumet, you, you'll see a, a road called Streetcar Electric Park Road. Head down that road, and you, some, you probably tough to pick it out where, where it is, but you can still see some remnants of Electric Park. Um, so there's lots of stories about it, but it was a, a extremely popular spot in the uh, in the in the summer months. Well, one of the things that we often think about is winter operations. Well, there were a few challenges in the winter, just like there are now. There were challenges for operating a, a streetcar system at the time too. This is kind of an interesting photo. This was. Uh, um, from February 26th, uh, uh, a few years ago, just uh, they did have snow then. Uh, this is 1908. As I joked uh, one time, I think I was giving this presentation. I said, "Well, this was just uh, taken last week up in Calumet." Um, so it, it did create some challenges, but there were some nice days. Uh, again, we're north of Boston uh, on one of those nice days. But in terms of uh, equipment, they basically had, um, let's say, three types of equipment. Uh, for, for, for you could say, for lighter snowfalls, they put a, they put a plow on the front of their street cars, and it would plow a path in front of the cars itself. A little more snow, they had they had uh, three of these plow vehicles that they would operate uh, that would plow snow out of the way. Uh, and then for really big ones, they had uh, two of these snowblower units that they would use. Um, so depending on how much snow and when the drifts took place, that would really, but this was kind of the more common operations in, in, uh, for lighter snowfalls. That's how they kind of handled the, the, uh, the snow, the winter operations. Pretty, still pretty dependable. Uh, that's what the unique parts were, is the dependable service and frequent service of the, of the streetcar. To give you some idea on passengers, 1909 was their biggest year. They handled 6.5 million passengers that year. And the average daily ridership was anywhere from 10,000 to 16,000 passengers a day. The 16,000 is really kind of an average is really a summer a summer day, often on a weekend, where people were were getting out and visiting different communities. The ten thousand was more of a typical winter day. Now there were a number of famous passengers. Uh, probably everybody in the audience can identify these three famous passengers. The one on the left is uh, Fred Taylor. He played hockey for the Portage Lake uh, uh, team uh, for a couple of years. He then went on. He was probably the highest paid athlete in the world in the, in the, in the early 1900s. Outstanding hockey player. Um, when he, he, he was actually being played to play for Portage Lake. He returned to Canada. He was making more money than the Prime Minister of Canada. He was a true free agent. He ended up in Vancouver, and many judge him as the the most outstanding hockey player of the of the first half of the 20th century. The 
the most outstanding player of the second half was Wayne Gretzky. So he had that Wayne Gretzky status in the first half of the 20th century. So he would ride the he would ride the car because there were ride the streetcars because there was service between um, between Houghton and Calumet and and around the Houghton Hancock area. The gentleman in the middle is uh, probably many recognize him as George Gipp, the famous legendary football player from Notre Dame. There's been many books written about him. But for several years, he ran a, a taxi service uh, from the Middle Range Railroad Station to, uh, to the Red Jacket area. He was born and raised in Lorium. He worked at the Michigan House uh, rest, uh, dining facility for many years. And there are even stories that he, he actually worked as a, as a motorman on the the um, Houghton County Railroad operations. The person on the far right is Big Louie, uh, Louis Molinen. He lived in Boston, and for a couple of years, he operated a tavern in downtown, in downtown Hancock. So he lived on a farm near Boston and would travel the streetcars to, to, his, to his work. At the time, or he was eight foot one inch tall and 400 pounds. So those are just three famous people that rode the streetcars. The service ended on May 17th, 1932. Well, what happened? Well, the, the copper industry declined after World War I. It was a private company. So there are other entrepreneurs that, that, uh, that, that had bus service that were competing with it. Uh, there was a decline in population after World War I, as many of the workers out of here moved to Detroit for the auto industry. And roads and roads improved and the automobile came along. So that provided the freedom for, for drivers to, to go to many areas in the copper country. Well, after the service ended, virtually all of the equipment was destroyed. There were a few cars that escaped. Um, but most were scrapped. I think this was out in the field someplace. And there's two or three others that we've talked to some of the um, the veterans of the area. They re they re they recall where some of the old cars are. So we've we've almost come to the end. Um, it's a fascinating story. Um, hopefully, I've just provided a little introduction and overview for you. Um, but as I say, after the uh, the book came out. And I did presentations locally. I had emails and calls and, and uh, people said, did you know? So thank you very much. Now it's your time. Did you know? So I'll open it up for questions, uh, Elise. Or maybe some have typed in some questions along the way here. Well, do, do you think, I have a question, do you think when they had the the bad weather, the, the heavy snow, that that would interfere with electricity getting to the getting to the trolley or the tracks? Was there any story of such? I, I never read any story that the snow would actually, that, that uh, transfer energy would ever be a problem. It seemed to be, it may be the slowed a little bit, but I never, I didn't read any, all the work, I never read anybody, well, we've shut down because we can't get electricity to the vehicles. Okay, well, that's the end. Okay, thanks. There may have been, but I never read, no one reported on it. Okay. Bill, this is Scott McInnes. There was a, um, I can't remember what the, I think it was Clarence Hawking was the, worked at the courthouse for many, many years, but he worked on the trolley cars. And when I first started working for the city, he had talked about uh, having to ride on top of the streetcar with a shovel during ice storms. So that the, he knocked the ice off before the the uh, rod actually was able to touch the wires. Oh, that's that's good information. That's what I said. I did. I hadn't heard that story, so that's why it's. Did you know? Thank you, Scott. Right. We have a question. Sure. So, what do you think that the streetcars will make a comeback? Uh, they've made a, a big comeback in many large cities. Um, 
they've uh, been very popular. Uh, I don't expect you, uh, one of the projects we did maybe 10 years ago, we looked at how much it would cost to bring back the streetcars in, in the copper country to serve the different components of the, um, of the uh, Kiwa National Historic Park. It becomes very prohibitive uh, from a cost and where do you get the money? Okay. At, at, at the time, at the time, the, the streetcar company operated out of the fare box. So there was no government subsidies. It was a private company. So the, the fares covered the cost of operating the system. And that's a challenge today to keep the fares reasonable on a transit system. There's usually uh, large subsidies to keep the fares at reasonable levels. When we looked at the project for the Cuba National Historic Park, the fares were, were going to be for a tour type, we're going to be fairly high just to operate it. That's not the capital cost involved. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good question. Hey, uh, this is Elise again. I'm going to read it. There's a, somebody posted to the um, chat that they grew up on Roger. I grew up on Jasper Avenue in Houghton and remember the tracks visible in the street in the 1950s thinks there was a small maintenance building on Ruby. Yes, there could have been. Yep. They did operate on Ruby and it did operate on, on uh, Jasper. And they, they dug out a number of tracks this year. And then when they, they rehabbed uh, Agate, there was a bunch of track, bunch of rails sitting there. If you wanted one, I could have got you one. Where'd I put it? Hey, pardon? I'm joking. Where would I put it? Well, that's what I, that's what I had. Where would I going to do with a section of rail? I, I was in Denver about five years ago, Denver, Colorado, and, and streetcars are revived there. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Well, you, if, in our area, if you look at the new, the Detroit Q line. Oh, I didn't realize. Also, they're still alive in, in San Francisco. Oh, they're alive. They, they've built new systems in many places. Uh, the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul area is just an amazing streetcar system. And the, the line in Detroit. Uh, but we're going to, in the next several years, you'll probably see more and more streetcar type systems being built. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned that the uh, cars were basically uh, switchable as far as direction. Yes. Um, was there any turntable or any Y where the actual car could be uh, uh, turned around for maintenance or for any special reason? No, they just, uh, almost like a stub line. So they would never have to turn them around basically. Oh, okay. You'll find some streetcar lines, some streetcars just one, go in one direction. So that's where you need to loop at the end of the route. Uh, okay. The, you point out the um, the cable cars in San Francisco, they get out turned around almost like a turntable. That's a little different arrangement. Yeah. See, so somebody's um, point out that there's excellent streetcars in New Orleans. There's, there's probably about 30 or 40 cities that have streetcars. Okay. Another question popped up is the streetcar station in Mohawk still there? It is not. It is not. There's this, what is, there is a station in Mohawk, isn't there? Where there's the ice cream? Is that the that's, station? That, that's in Amique. Oh, in okay. Amique, there is a, the, uh, the ice cream. Uh, for a while, it was called the streetcar ice cream parlor or something. And so the streetcar went by that that location. But in, in uh, Mohawk, uh, it is, is not there. It was located at one time. Uh, it would be um, west of US 41 in that part of town. And there's a couple of questions here. Barbara asks, where were the cars manufactured? And Steve asks, do we know who made the cars? Yes, uh, the cars were, many of the cars were manufactured in Chicago. And uh, the companies that uh, I, I put it in the book. It's, I'm just kind of leafing through the book now. Um, many of the cars were Beryl, B-R-I-L. 
and they were manufactured in Chicago and Lacona was another manufacturer and, and they, Chicago was the main place they were manufactured. So in the book there, you'll find uh, uh, kind of a, the snow fighting equipment and its dimensions and uh, all the stuff on the, the, the motors and the, the purchase price of the cars and so on. Uh, put together a table of, of the equipment with the car number and so on. So in the book, you'll find several different photos of different cars, uh, you know, different, it came on, uh, most, of the, most of the cars were, were acquired in the first few years of the operations. Um, Dennis says that the Mohawk station was torn down and the lumber was reused because it doesn't remember if it was uh, for a house or outbuildings. Yeah, I can't remember. I've, I've driven by the location and there's, I can't remember what's there now. And James asks, uh, how often did mishaps occur like streetcar motor vehicle collisions? There were a few. Um, I don't know how often, but there were a few. And Thanks for the talk, Bill. I'm out of here. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, someone else asks if there will be presentations on the Copper Country Railroad. And um, I could address that in that we're happy to look at doing any presentation someone is interested in giving and attending. So if you have a source or a suggestion like that, please just email it to me at history at cityofhoughton.com and I'd be happy to look, look, at, look into it. Okay, thank you. Should I volunteer? I've done that several times at Michigan Tech. Uh, Bill, if you're willing to volunteer, <laughs> we'd be happy to have you again. Yeah, we've, we've done that presentation a number of times. Uh, okay. at, uh, the different rail, rail systems and where they all went. So well, I just I'll, have to toss the you presentation on, to you. I'll get with you on that shortly. Okay. <laughs> um, I did have a question though. You mentioned that a lot of cities are looking into um, adding streetcars? Yes, it's a very popular way of, uh, um, of, of getting around. It's, uh, you know, um, you start to think of the large cities in these metro subway type systems, they became too, too expensive. And bus systems, uh, um, uh, there's a, a capacity limitation. So on some heavily used routes, they put on, uh, put on articulated buses, but when the demand gets really hard, we got to go to a different level. And so, so it's kind of an intermediate capacity capabilities with lots of flexibility. So you'll see a lot of cities have built, recently built new streetcar systems, kind of the mid-sized cities in the United States and Canada. And is that, is, is subways, I mean, subways have the advantage of not being uh, competing for traffic space. Uh, but is that the infrastructure of building underground? Is that what makes there, uh, there are some streetcars that you can do a number of things with them? You can right, put them on the street, you can put them in their separate right of way, you can put them underground, you can put them in elevated structures. So it does, it's a, a much less, less expensive system mm -hmm. than the subway metro type systems. So if you look at say uh, one that operates downtown uh, and underground is Pittsburgh. Um, they, or there's some sections of the Boston system that operate underground. Some sections of San Francisco streetcar operates underground. Um, I was asking my own question, lost track of people's, other people's questions. Um, Glenn comments that the um, railroad would be, presentation would be great. He worked on the Copper Range Railroad for the summers in the 60s. Uh, Steve comments that the Milwaukee opened a small line two or three years ago against great opposition. Yep. Um, what about robotic rail cars, Michael asks? You mean, are you thinking automated? cars of some kind? There are? Uh, I don't know, Michael, you could unmute yourself and ask the question directly. I, it just says, what about robotic rail cars? Well, 
I see the question here. What about robotic rail cars? Oh, there are, like self-driving. Yeah, there, there is a move now. There's um, a number of initiatives on uh, uh, autonomous transit vehicles. Uh, they're just in their infancy now, but there's some work being done throughout the United States and Europe on autonomous transit vehicles. Uh, there are a variety of transit systems automated. So you just think of a, uh, an elevator operating, operating uh, horizontally. So many airports have, have automated transit systems at, at airports. There are a couple of systems that operate in downtown. Maybe many in this audience have been to the Detroit uh, downtown people mover. There's no, there's no drivers on those ones and it's completely automated. The larger system is in Vancouver SkyTrain is an automated system. There are no drivers. Um, so there are a number of examples around there, are, but there seems to be some move now to autonomous transit vehicles, rubber tire vehicles operating on the street, just like uh, autonomous uh, automobiles or self-driving automobiles. We'll, we may see that in the next, within the next 20 years. There are some experiments being done in different parts of the United States now. Um, thank, thank you, William. I really enjoyed your presentation, but I'm going to sign off now. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you to you. <laughs> yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I can't seem to unmute, but thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. You've unmuted. I heard you. You heard me. Okay. <laughs> but you can get the copper in. I read, I read your lips. I read your lips. Oh. oh. I heard you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do. I have another question. Sure. Um, did the uh, did the uh, streetcar system? Um, did they haul uh, haul any like small amounts of freight or mail or anything anything besides passengers? Not that I'm aware of. Um, the, a lot of the mail stuff was handled on the intercity rail system. There were uh, several rail services that 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 did that part. Okay. I'm not, well, I'm not not aware of them handling any small packages at the time. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I did enjoy your your your. Uh, program and I look forward to any railroad uh, talks that you may give in the future. I will check the uh, website for the Carnegie okay. Museum. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay I think um, probably wrap it up now. If there's any more questions, speak now or chat. <laughs> um, all right, Bill, thank you so much. This is a great presentation. I never expected um, doing it by Zoom to hit our capacity as we often did in the museum, but there you go. Champagne well, that's problems. Great. Thank you for the whole audience. Uh, yeah. I, I must say I was surprised to see the large number too. <laughs> and thank you everyone for um, Can I say it now? Yeah, mm -hmm. coming along. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey. Hello, yeah. Hey, are, are, you, are you okay with the last one? Yeah, sure. I can answer it. I, I wondered uh, if you had had a, uh, a a little story about how frightening the uh, cars were. It was my, my mother had told me she rode the uh, uh, the system uh, steadily, but uh, she was younger, and and she said that it was uh, one of the scariest things you'd ever want to do especially if the cars passed one another. And, and there is also a, a bridge or several uh, bridges that, uh, that, that made you uh, scared silly over whether or not they're going to uh, get you across it or not. So I just thought, you know, I, I didn't hear anybody else uh, mention that <laughs> there may have been these times Riding the system, they were they they they're wonderful to get you there, and you were awfully glad that they had managed to do it. <laughs> I think you're quite right. The some of the trussles may be a little scary for some passengers, and I think you're quite right. Some of the bypass sections were 
were um, were very close. Oh, when the um, a good story on the, the original oh, Portage Lake Lift Bridge when they or Portage Lake Bridge when they put those two rails down that uh, that were used in the cover or the ads that lease put out those uh, rails were too close together when they first put them in and so they had to go back and move them over about six inches because oh, they hadn't planned it quite right that the two cars could pass each other at the same time. Best you know, don't don't put your hand out or anything that's, like that's right. that. That's right. That's right. The the best news was, uh, she I don't think she had to pay anything when she rode the uh, system. Yeah, children rode free. Children rode free. Yeah. And she probably, as you said, she's so probably thanks a child so much for the information. You're quite welcome, Lee. So, so, all right. Thank thank, thanks, Bill. Uh, thank, you, so much. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Enjoy the so evening. Enjoy. Good job. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.